Good evening, everybody. I'll now call the Tuesday, August 24th, 2021, regular meeting of council to order. First item on the agenda, prior to uh, getting going here, I'd really like to uh, thank our director of Area H, Regional District Phrase Fort George, Daniel Allen, for uh, joining us this evening. Welcome. And with that, we'll have uh, item 2.1, adoption of this evening's agenda. As amended, uh, there's a, been a change to the report for item 8.4 under the permissive tax exemption. Councilor G, Councilor Pearson, any further amendments? Hearing none, all in favor? It's carried. Item 3.1, adoption of the minutes of the 20, uh, July 27th, 2021 regular meeting of council be adopted as presented. Councilor Blanchett, Councilor McLean, any errors or omissions arising? Hearing none, all in favor? It's carried. Item 3.2, adoption of the minutes of the July 27, 2021 public hearing be adopted as presented. Councillor G, Councillor Blanchette, any errors or omissions arising? All in favor? It's carried. Under item 4.1, we do have a delegation this evening from the Valmont Housing Committee. Uh, here to give us a rundown on the impacts on local housing due to the Trans Mountain expansion project. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> um, my name is Corey Marshall. And this is uh, Eugene Jamin. Um, Jen Applebaum was planning to be with us as well. She's helped us uh, create this presentation. Um, she was feeling a little ill and did not want to risk spreading viruses, so she stayed home. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jen and I have been members of the Housing Committee since its inception, um, and Eugene joined us in very early uh, 2020 on the committee. Um, we have members from three nonprofit housing providers in Valmont, um, a property manager, small, bu uh, small business representatives, along with the um, economic development officer, planner, and counselor. Um, and we are here today on behalf, let me sc scroll in the right direction, there we go. Um, we're here on behalf of the Housing Committee, which was created in 2017, um, based on a recommendation in the 2016 Housing Needs and Demand Report by Housing Strategies, Inc. Um, we're here today to update Council on our work and discussions and to share concerns we've been discussing related to pipeline impacts on housing. The Committee last made presentations to Council on uh, January 2018 and April 2019. We recognize now that the Housing Committee needs to be more proactive updating Council of emerging issues discussed at our meetings. Since our presentation in April 2019, planner Megan Vincente helped amend six zoning bylaws based on the recommendations in October 2017 to increase housing options by reducing minimum parcel size, floor area, allow residential dwellings with commercial use, permit secondary suites and secondary homes in more zones. In July 2019, we also shared the concerns about the pipeline impact on housing and requested that all workers be housed in camp. In November of 2019, um, we went through two strategic planning sessions um, to clarify the role and working relationship among the group and with the village. We arrived at uh, a mandate for the Housing Committee um, uh, as that it was an opportunity to discuss projects um, amongst ourselves, um, obviously an, uh, an opportunity to, ad to advise Council and to explore new housing options. Um, we talked about coordinating roles and clarifying expectations of various groups such as a developer, partner, operator, or service provider, and we also um, decided that the Seniors Housing Society should lead, um, be the lead proponent um, to BC Housing Spring 2020 intake based on survey results that we had carried out and projects that were already underway. Um, SIMP First Nation members also joined the committee in February 2020. Sharon McKay and Jules Phillip have, been, um, have joined our meetings on a regular basis and shared valuable information. Um, Sharon and her colleague Mary came to Valmont last month to meet with some of our committee members and to tour Juniper Square too. 
Our volunteer committee has researched and gathered a lot of information on bylaws, housing reports, grants, etc. In March 2020, the Housing Committee formally put down the need for a housing staff position on the agenda. This part-time housing staff position would support the village with bylaw changes, seek developers, housing partners, and explore options for housing not being pursued by the current housing organizations. October 2020. Committee requested staff to develop a multi-year proposal for a part-time housing coordinator with funds from NDIT, CBT Housing, and Village of Elmount. Since updating housing needs reports is now the responsibility of municipalities, and affordable housing is identified in the OCP. Many of us are seeing impacts of additional pipeline workers on affordable housing. We heard that local pipeline workers were much higher than when the original uh, temporary use permit for the worker camp was approved in 2019. We were told then that the camp would house 600 workers and 150 workers were to live in town during those three week periods. In June 2021, uh, we made a motion for the Housing Committee to receive a presentation from the TMX um, to receive first-hand information on their numbers. We found out after the fact that Trans Mountain's community liaison had made a presentation to Council on July 27th. Jasmine Devick said there are currently 1,100 pipe, uh, pipeline workers in Valemount, with 560 of those in camp and 40 rooms reserved for quarantine spaces. So we have 350 more workers in town than was estimated in late 2019. Vail Mountain area is forced to absorb and house 500 pipeline workers um, for multiple years, including some with families that have relocated with them. This is impacting housing availability and affordability of rental housing and ownership. We heard Councillor Blanchett ask about the possibility of expanding the camp. Um, we confirmed with Kenna Jonkman, um, RDFG, RDFFG staff, that the temporary use permit for the Trans Mountain Work Camp was approved for 900 people. Um, when the permit was under consideration, the village had expressed concerns about impacts of house on housing when we thought we were only, only having 150 pipeline workers in town. We talked to local campgrounds to find out they were accommodating pipeliners. Three of them have to shut down or reduce services, uh, service sites during the winter. The biggest one can add sites uh, allocated for tourists and absorb the sites close, closed down in other campgrounds. It's also come to my attention there are campsites outside of Valemount where people are bringing in trailers onto their property. The campground received between six and 15 calls daily seeking spots from pipeliners. This means over 360 workers still need housing in Valemount. Uh, Rustic Luxury Home Services, Jen Applebaum, um, is the only property manager in town, and she has nearly 100 rentals in, their por in her portfolio. And she tracked um, requests and inquiries that she had through June and July, and found significantly more inquiries from pipeliners than from locals, as you can see from these numbers. And that does not even reflect in uh, inquiries to realtors um, and the Facebook posts. Um, we are seeing multiple posts on multiple groups daily. And while the pipeline has helped Vail Mount businesses during lockdown and increased revenue for many businesses during COVID, the large number of pipeline workers living outside of camp for a small community like ours has had an adverse, has ad adversely impacted housing, staff, and food availability. This is information that uh, Jen has gathered over the last couple of weeks. Um, staffing shortages and lack of staff housing has led to lost revenue, reduced hours for many businesses. 
um, while serving pipeliner workers may be an opportunity for businesses, small local businesses do not have the capacity to gear up for additional customers with increased staffing and inventory to meet the needs of double the population. A small community like Valemount cannot absorb 500 more people in the town on a three to five year basis without impacting lo locals. Village staff has been attentive to the problems arising and proactively passed the new temporary residential structures policy. We need more action from council and staff so that the service industry workers as well as professionals can find a place in Valemount. Otherwise, we will have a shortage of important services. We have three nonprofits serving seniors, families, and women at risk. Missing is the housing for the service industry, staff housing. Valmont renters cannot compete with pipeliners for rent when the pipeliners get a living out allowance upwards of 4,000 a month. Businesses are faced with staffing shortages due to lack of affordable housing and it is subsequently affecting their bottom line. The additional pipeline workers in town are also impacting the food availability through our only grocery store. We need a multi-pronged approach to make Valemount desirable and accessible to many who make way less than in other parts of the province, especially pipeliners. Um, village staff noticed additional RVs in town and proactively passed the temporary residential structures. We have some additional suggestions to ease the impacts. As part of the temporary use permit for the work camp, it should be expanded to 900 workers. Valemount can become a partner in resolving housing issues by leasing land to Trans Mountain for RVs and ATCO trailers like the industrial park has done. We could involve SIMC to become a partner in developing solutions for more housing. We could develop a housing fund with a small percentage of live out allowance of pipeliners living in town, a percentage of municipal and, re and regional district tax, and a small percentage from new developments or from DCCs. This could directly be used to help develop housing opportunities, uh, sorry, housing with opportunities for businesses to directly partner on a staff housing project, as well as help create a part-time village housing staff position. The municipality has an opportunity and ability to raise funds quickly for housing development in a way that nonprofit housing providers can't. A small percentage of LOA, if invested, invested in a housing fund, will have a huge impact on our community as a small village. Um, through OCP land, uh, land identified in the OCP, we could create opportunities for affordable home ownership. We are requesting the council appoint a representative of the housing committee, committee to the Trans Mountain Accommodations Committee. Um, we ask that council and staff work more closely with the housing committee and, and um, its expertise and experience on local housing issues. And we request that um, council requests Trans Mountain to share their staffing information that they're already sending to the clinic um, and pass that on to the housing committee. We recognize the staff may be working on solutions. We wanted to share some ideas that came from the committee and businesses to help mitigate impacts. Thank you to council for the opportunity to be part of the housing committee and hearing us tonight. We welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much for the delegation. Motion to receive. Councillor G, Councillor Pearson. Questions for the delegation? Comments? There's quite a list there. Councillor Blanchett. I'm just wondering if what happened when you um, asked RDFFG about the temporary use permit for the 900 people? if they were going to phone and see if they were going to put them in there? Uh, Kenna didn't say anything about that. Um, I had indicated to her that Jasmine had said they couldn't um, expand, um, and she confirmed that they had applied for up to 900 in the temporary use permit, and they were granted that, so she doesn't know why they wouldn't 
go you forward with that. Hold Jasmine at all, or did you try? Or I, I have tried. I've never. Uh, I got one response from Jasmine a year and a half ago. <laughs> So maybe we could reach out to Jasmine and ask her about this and see why we can't put the fill that camp up. If it's if the TUP is for 900 people, let's fill it up. It's not the time for debate, but I'll just say that during the presentation, if you recall from the previous delegation, the TUP was up to 900, mm -hmm. but the Canadi Canadian Energy Associate or a Canadian Energy Regulator had a max of 650 for that spot. That's what Trans Mountain said. In there oh, as well. Okay. Further questions, comments? I know the administrator has the second to last page written out. Most of it. Councilor Pearson. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I I find we're in a really difficult spot because we're looking at a major issue for three to five years. Um, so to go crazy and build housing based on where we, where we are now in five years, we have empty doors. Um, I, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, it's this is a really difficult spot and I don't know how we work through this one. I very much agree with you, uh, Pete. The loss is in our businesses here in town. So many businesses are finding they're short of staff now. Even the grocery store, their manager uh, would come if he had housing and they couldn't find housing for him, which really impacts our community. So it's long term is really, it, it may be only five years, but during that five years, there may be a very significant impact on our local economy yeah no I agree I agree 100% I think there's other factors to the staffing issue that uh, aren't relevant to this discussion but um, yeah that's all I have further thank you so much for bringing this to council we always appreciate having a delegation from our committees and uh, as I mentioned the administrator has a bunch of ideas. Thank you for sharing the, the presentation as well. Uh, we, we have the ability uh, <laughs> and know how to get you uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor of receipt? Carried. Correspondence for action under 6.1, Ministry of Environment, confirmation of meeting. Uh, you'll see in the package that uh, a recommendation here that Council confirms a time for a Zoom meeting with the Ministry of Environment per the attached correspondence. Councillor Blanchett. I would like to um, see if we want to do Monday the 13th. We're already on the, in the morning. We're seeing Northern Health that day. So why don't we get just... If we want to confirm a if we want to if confirm want a meeting, to? and then we can work on times and dates after okay. that. Okay, all right. Can I get a seconder, Councillor Pearson? You're looking at the 13th because we're already meeting with Northern Health. Yeah. Okay. Other ideas? There was a really open one on the. Would have been Monday. Okay, so it's Monday the 13th. Sorry. There was a really, uh, there was three, two dates prior to UBCM. There's a chance that we'll be meeting with uh, ministers. We haven't, we haven't confirmed those yet. But there was a, a date, I really can't remember, I don't have the, the attachment in front of me, uh, that was really open-ended. It was like 10 o'clock on Wednesday. Wednesday? September 8th. September 8th. Uh, that would probably give us the most flexibility out of all those dates. Do, have we heard about if we're getting our meeting with the Minister of Health yet? Uh, we, because that's the big one for me. That's the big one that I want to make sure. We haven't sure heard I've, from anybody. I've got okay. We've had one transition from Flynnrow over to community ser uh, over to Citizen Services, as it has to do with connectivity, but we haven't been confirmed even for that meeting. Other thoughts? 
I mean, I, I'm okay with 13, 13 the 11, because you're already kind of in a UBCM mode. As long as it doesn't interfere with meeting with the other minister, then we're good to go. Well, let's keep it during the week of UBCM then. We don't need an amendment. You got the spirit of the resolution. Yeah, we just need a vote. All in favor for the uh, 13th? Carried. Thank you, Council. Uh, anything out of the reading file? Anybody would like to highlight? Councillor Pearson. Yeah, I just. Um Item two, the Northern Health uh, letter to municipalities revert regarding COVID and industry. Uh, I just find it frustrating in, on how th these are communicated out. Uh, Site C has an incident, it's an outbreak. Valmont has an incident, it's a cluster. Um, we have, you know, upwards of 30 affected employees plus those others quarantined and uh, I don't quite understand the, the distinction between a cluster and, a, and an outbreak other than one is a uh, provincial project and one is a federal project maybe, but. I think you hit the nail right on the head there, <laughs> Councilor. So, yeah, no, I just am continually frustrated with their uh, communication. I do have a call in with Steve Rapier, communications. Uh, he has not returned my call. Was there a follow-up, Councillor? No, that's okay. all for me. Anything catch the eye of other members? Moving on. Administrative reports, 8.1, accounts payable report, July 2021, the report be received. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor McLean. Anything catch your eye? Discussion? All in favor of receipt? It's carried. We have a building inspection report for July 2021 20, uh, regarding the permit values. The report to be received. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor G. Discussion? All in favor? Receipt? It's carried. 8.3 bylaw enforcement summary report, July 2021. Report be received. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Blanchett. Discussion? Excellent, Councillor Pearson. Yeah, very good report. I mean, it's it's nice to see the number of cases that are being dealt with. Um, I was going to comment though in in the by officers' other comments as we get to the bottom there in discussing the RV situation, and uh, I'm just curious where it says heading into September October will force many RV users out of the temporary residential structures into more permanent residences. I'm not sure where they're going to find those more permanent residences to move into come October. But <laughs> feedback from administration. Uh, my understanding is there there are some empty spaces in the camp at this time that they would be able to move some of those people into. Uh, but yes, that's a really good question. Uh, where will those RVs uh, go? Uh, there's the potential for them to move on to other properties. For example, in some situations, you have uh, multiple RVs on one property. So, um, yeah, it'll be uh, interesting to see how that goes. Uh, I'm hearing musings of campground expansions and some even coming into play. Rumors. But if they come to fruition, there's 50 to 100 new sites. Rumors at this point. Further? Um, good? Yeah. All in favor of receipt? Carried. We have uh, under 8.4 uh, 2022 permissive tax exemptions. We have four to consider tonight. I'll put a, ask council to put a motion onto the floor to consider them as a block. Councilor Blanchett, Councilor Pearson, and then we'll amend that to, as we're considering this as a block, does anybody have any recommendations moving forward? Quick question before. Um, in dealing with them as a block, uh, how does that affect conflict of interest as we are have a couple conflicts in the room? It shouldn't because you're considering the whole thing as a, as a blanket block. Okay, no, just wanted to. Confirmed on record, thanks. 
Councillor Blanchett. Um, do we have any funds left for the COVID fund that was to help with the municipal stuff? We do, but it would not be applicable. It doesn't cover to this. any of this kind of thing. No. For next year. Mm -hmm. Further recommendations as as the block. We don't have to consider them as a block either. <laughs> it is on the floor. I mean, I can say all. In, uh, I can ask, pose the question, and if it doesn't pass, it doesn't pass. Just, I, I mean, I think we all find these very difficult decisions to to discuss ad hoc, and as they're thrown to us in a meeting situation. Um, and and I know we talked last year that this was going to be an ongoing where we did one vote and it was going to be a five-year term which takes takes some of the pressure off on an annual basis but um, I know part of that was predicated by our favorite word COVID last time so I don't I mean we were 10 percent I mean I'm not sure how everybody's being affected by this but I'll throw 25% across the board on Seconder to that amendment. Councillor G, discussion on the amendment. Councillor Blanchett. So you want to do 25 across the board. So that puts up um, less than a dollar fifty per hundred thousand. And yeah, on the residential, and about five to f four to five dollars on the commercial, each on the hundred thousand. I believe that number would be right. Yeah, just roughly, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just I still have a hard time. I know that we've advanced somewhat economically, but we're still having a lot of people struggle. Um, I would be happier with fifteen to twenty just because I know that everybody is still struggling, businesses included, the, um, the um, nonprofits as well. But I would have liked to have seen the nonprofits reach out to other places more. They're always coming to the village and asking the residents to help them, which I get. But when the residents themselves are probably some of them not even working, you know, I have a hard time saying, hey, can you help this one group or that group? Um, so I just I have a hard time with this one, especially knowing that we're still not out of it. Yeah. Um, so counterpoint, um, I think the reason we are looking at this is because the organizations are intended to be putting back into the community in, um, I guess, a more charitable way versus businesses. Um, so I think that's I think that's what we need to look at is what the intent of these organizations are in the community and what their benefits are to the community versus a corporate entity in the in the community. Okay, so I didn't mean businesses. I meant like like I mean I'm working for a place where you know like I I make a wage. Yeah. Um, but I might not be able to afford to help my place because I'm not working full time or I got my hours cut, you know, that kind of thing. That's what I meant. You know, we're asking the residents that, that have homes here to help. Some of them may not be working full time and may not be able to afford this. That's my... You know. Back to you, Councilor Pearson. <laughs> I feel like we need a tennis net here. Mm -hmm. um, I I think only in reading the report, only the one of these actually affects residential properties. Mm -hmm. The other three are affected within the business community. So that impact is a lot less on our everyday citizen. Well, those everyday citizens also have businesses here, right? Mm -hmm. Which we're asking them to pitch in and help. We're all in the same boat but we're having different words or however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. But I mean... So perhaps we've gotten to that point of the discussion where I'll call the question on the amendment. 
If it passes, passes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Amendment being? 25%. Okay. So on the amendment, 25% across the board, all in favor? One, two. It, <laughs> opposed? It carries. Would you like to have your opposition recorded? Thank you. And back to the original motion as amended, as a block, all in favor. Carried. Eight point five water supply master plan. The recommendation here under eight point five, sorry, uh, the recommendation here the council approve sixty three thousand fifty dollars fifty two cents for the northern capital planning grant for the purpose of well drilling program with Kayla Geosciences Limited. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor Pearson, discussion on the master plan. Or sorry, well drilling program. Well drilling program. We're not to the master plan yet. Any discussion? Drilling some test holes? It's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're seeing on July 30th that we probably should be looking at some wells. All in favor? It's carried. 8.6 Wood Stove Exchange Program. Staff be directed to apply to the Ministry of Environment Wood Stove Exchange Program to continue the Wood Stove Exchange Program for through 2022. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor McLean, discussion. Councillor Blanchett. This is a really good program that as we've seen we need, and um, staff are fantastic at getting um, all the information out and all the educational pieces done. So I'd like to thank them for that. We've had a good year, and hopefully next year we'll have as much success. Um. And this, uh, this is, uh, comes through support from the Clean Air Task Force? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, any idea what the uptake has been for the 2021 Wood Stove Exchange Program? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, we have the grant clerk right here filling in today. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> My, my understanding is that there were four approved at this time. How many, sir? There's four, four approved. And we are sort of in the middle of the year as well. So I'm thinking that probably in the next couple of months we're going to see another rise. Very good. Uh, and for the folks at home, uh, just to reiterate, our grant clerk doesn't have a mic in front of her. Uh, this is specifically for Mrs. Recchi. Uh, the grant clerk had mentioned that there had been four uptakes for the wood stove exchange program uh, we are anticipating more as we move into the colder, cooler months any further discussion all in favor it's carried bylaws and policies 9.1 village of Valmont zoning bylaw number 847 2021 be adopted as presented fourth and final reading Councillor G, Councillor Pearson, discussion on fourth and final. So looking forward to this opportunity for everybody. I mean, it opens up so many different opportunities to get construction going. All in favor? It's carried. 9.2, the Village of Elmont. Bylaw Notice Enforcement and Dispute Adjudication Amendment Bylaw Number 849 be given first, second, and third reading. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor Pearson, discussion, first, second, third. Making it easier, going through Victoria, not through the courts. <laughs> All in favor? It's carried. No new business this evening. I, uh, any notices of motion? I have one notice of motion to forward, please, and that is for staff to research freedom of the city. Uh, freedom of the city, in a, in a roundabout way, gives the uh, welcomes our town to military forces uh, in Canada. Those being the uh, specifically the Canadian Rangers, Canadian Junior Rangers, and the Rocky Mountain Rangers, as they have given to our so-called city. We should give them freedom of the city and that means they can parade means they can join us here in council uh, versus uh, 
for, for staff to research whether or not this is a proclamation or a designation, as it were. Do you need a seconder or notices? Yes, seconder? Councilor Blanchett? Any discussion on that notice of motion? Clear as mud? All in favor? It's carried. Council reports. Councilor Blanchett. Not a lot. It's been a summer, good summer. So August 12th, we had our housing meeting, and as you've heard, we're having some stressful discussions. Um, but I just wanted to throw out there in, in my report, maybe we could look at something about the village leased land here to TMX and see about if we could find some um, housing units that could go up there, something to talk about um, later maybe. We could figure that out. Um, because we're in real, as you saw and heard, we're in trouble here. And I think everybody knows somebody that's having some kind of issue or problem. Um, so the sooner we could jump on board and work with staff and work with uh, the housing committee to get this figured out, the better we'll all be. Because winter's coming and it gets cold, right? So let's figure out what to do. And on the 17th, we had the meeting with BC Hydro. Um, I came in at the end there because I was having connectivity problems. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> you know. Um, no, and, I know. And that's everything. Thank you very much. Let's go across the room. Councillor McLean. Um, I only had one event, and that was on July 28th. I had a Columbia Basin Trust local government committee Zoom meeting. Local government? Okay. Yeah. Any highlights? Um, no, that we're reiterating our role and looking at budgets, and okay. that's pretty much it for now. Waiting. Thank you very much. Thanks. Back across the room, Councillor G. Um, I just have one thing, and that was I uh, attended the our emergency meeting there the day of the evacuation alert, kind of accidentally, <laughs> with the village and the fire department, and uh, got tasked to notify the seniors in the Golden Ears Lodge, mm -hmm. and. Uh, not surprisingly, they were already very well informed. They know what's going on in this town before we do, I think. Yeah. <laughs> a very real possibility. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my report. Thank you so much. Back across the room. Councilor Pearson. Okay. Um, August 3rd, actually, uh, we failed to have a quorum for tourism, but uh, we had a, a good discussion on some of the issues as we as we move forward. August 10th, uh, sat in on the BC Hydro two-tier uh, rate presentation. Uh, it was interesting. I'm not quite sure where it's going to lead at this point, but um, they put on a good presentation. And then again on August 17th, uh, the BC Hydro um, debriefing on the uh, extended power outage on March 29th. Um, learned a little, a lot more about their system. Um, really didn't get any clarification on what we can do to mitigate the circumstances going forward. But uh, the one thing I did raise in that too, and it would have been nice to have TELUS involved as a stakeholder, uh, how, how they will deal with their lack of capacity in having us lose internet and cell coverage after uh, I think it was 12 hours so uh, so it was a, it was a good debrief and uh, yesterday attended the uh, TOTA so that would be the Thompson Okanagan Tourism Association accessibility team um, barbecue uh, amazing group of people in town. Um, it's it's kind of led by a, an associate professor out of UB, UNBC, and what they are doing is inventorying uh, accessibility in our community. And ours was the first to roll this out, and so they're checking out trail um, businesses, the community in general just making an inventory and they're creating an app so that people with with disabilities would be able to have this app and they will be able to look and say, okay, 
this business I can get into, this business I can't, this business has accessible washrooms, et cetera, and, and right down to the trails. Um, the mayor joined them today for their walk at the marsh. Uh, and, and it's interesting, I had a great conversation with them last, last night because as much as we think we have a handle on accessibility, unless you see it from their, their viewpoint, um, just little things. You look at how many businesses in our community have a, a two inch threshold to get through a door. That's a challenge in a chair. So a uh, great team, uh, had a great conversation. Uh, our MLA Shirley Bond was in attendance <clears throat> as well. Um, yeah, it was, it was a great learning experience and they're here for the week uh, doing various activities and checking out businesses and Main Street and, and Fifth Avenue. So that's what I have. That was big. Uh, July 30th, I had a joint, uh, I attended a joint EOC briefing regarding the Swift Creek Mountain landslide at about uh, 9.30 at night. Um, text my wife, said uh, I'm going to the EOC uh, with a response of, should I be packing? <laughs> um, let's just find out first. Uh, followed that, but, and that was with the geomorphologist uh, the very next day um, with uh, input from uh, Flinro, EMBC, uh, some geotechs, uh, staff thought of prudent, both, all staff from the joint EOC uh, and certainly my uh, first evacuation alert was enacted due to that landslide. Uh, August 5th, Thank you to council for sending me to the retirement dinner for long-serving Judge Brecknell. Um, found out that he's not retiring. Uh, he's just taking a step back. Uh, he'll be here part-time um, because he just built a brand new house in Prince George and he has yet to buy the drapes. So um, not fully retiring. Uh, uh, it, was, it was very, very nice. Uh, no, no, but we did get some pretty entertaining stories from his time on the bench here over the years. Uh, I was joined by two provincial prosecutors, defense attorney, uh, court clerks, it was, it was, and, and the sheriff's department. It was very nice. Um, August 7th, I did present uh, a bit of a state uh, to the uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Rangers during their senior officer planning session, and I believe that same day... This, that morning, I think the city of Vernon went on evacuation alert, and we kind of went through a, yeah, it's, it's something for rural BC to evacuate to Prince George or evacuate to Calumps, but what does it look like when 60,000 people evacuate? Where do, they, where, where do they go? And that was one of their, their planning sessions was how do we both cater to the supply chain and to the human chain? So we still have to get supplies down this highway, but when you throw... 30, 40, 50,000 people onto it. What does that look like? Uh, August 10th, uh, just about every day, but August 10th was the first big uh, BC wildfire update from uh, Minister Conroy. And then later that day, uh, joined council uh, at the two tier rate presentation by BC Hydro. Um, I too am wondering how they're going to roll out the various programs. I think they're. If I remember correctly, they're going to the BCUC with a couple of ideas. Uh, the village has an opportunity to comment, and they also can take it a step forward to request intervener status. So I think it's a, a good opportunity moving forward uh, throughout 2021 to really consider uh, how folks along the sort of Hefley Creek to Shelley Corridor would be impacted by a two-tier, a single-tier fixed rate uh, because we do not have access to another form of heat uh, versus, uh, you know, other than wood stove and we're phasing those out. So uh, really start to think about those things moving forward. August 12th had a BC COVID update as well as another wildfire update. I think the, oh, the Tremont Creek uh, fire had just erupted then. Uh, we had a, a big sound of relief on August 13th when the Vail Mount and RDFFG 
EOC um, rescinded the evacuation alert. So uh, my heartfelt thanks to EOC staff, uh, both here in Valmount and uh, their team with the RDFFG. Uh, with a smile, I had an interview with the Rocky Mountain Goat down at the salmon viewing platform as we talked about uh, salmon repopulation in the Spruce City Wildlife Initiative. The tank is coming. I don't know the exact date, but the tank is coming. Tank is coming. <laughs> so for the fry tank upstairs, they were collecting uh, eggs and, uh, and sperm, taking them back to their lab, uh, hatching, bringing them back, holding them upstairs. Uh, I should have known this before, but the tank will be at the same temperature that they took those eggs out of Swift Creek at, and they'll be reintroducing those eggs at the very same temperature. So very cool. Um, and then it all started. August 17th, I had a CBC interview with the uh, recreational vehicle uh, temporary use permit structures. Um, joined council again for the debrief from BC Hydro regarding the March 29 power outage. And I do agree with you, Councillor. I would like a follow-up from TELUS, if we can, Mr. Administrator, regarding their capacity during a lengthy power outage. This is one thing to... Uh, live without lights. It's another thing not to be able to communicate with your friends and neighbors. And luckily, March 29 was fairly balmy. Um, had reports of living rooms down to 5 degrees. It wasn't minus 25 degrees. So, very cool. Uh, the interviews just kept on coming for the temporary use permit for recreational vehicles on August uh, 18th, uh, one with Global TV. And then a plethora of discussion with other mayors, uh, Mayor uh, Dolores Funk from Burns Lake. Uh, we talked about First Nations and tourism trails. Uh, her husband was in town for the transition from LDM to um, Emil Anderson, as well as a uh, summer audit. So we had a good discussion while she was in town. And then later that day, a uh, nice conversation with Port Edward Mayor Knut Bjorndal, uh, Bjorn Dahl again on the RV TUP. And then CKNW, we had a nice chat with them down in North Vancouver with the RV TUPs. And then our old friend Mike Sato uh, was in town, uh, renowned Japanese uh, hot springs developer. Uh, we had a quick discussion on swimming pool regulations and how they pertain to the territory of the Yukon, which there are none. So um, his uh, Tahini, if anybody has a chance, look up uh, the Tahini project. Uh, he is building it by hand, not a single piece of equipment. Um, basically a tripod with a bunch of pulleys. Every rock that's over one ton gets moved with a rickety old tripod. That's Mike. Uh, Radio NL on the 19th interview with the RVTUP. Uh, and then a day of RD uh, meetings, uh, first starting with the Connectivity Committee, had a uh, presentation from the province regarding the uh, SpaceX rollout of Starlink, how that pertains to... Daniel, uh, Director Allen can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but there isn't a ground-based uplink here in Canada due to the gigahertz signals that's required, so you have a... You have a backbone of fiber uh, servicing these they look like spheres but imagine they're dishes and they uplink uh, fiber connectivity to the satellites bounce back down to the residences they take a certain gigahertz of communication and Canada has not allowed that for the uplink what they have allowed was uh, they've partnered with a Canadian company for that same service so they say we're coming online in 2024, 2025 uh, for a Canadian version of Starlink. So stay tuned. Um, Committee of the Whole meeting on the 19th had a presentation from the BC Emergency Health Services uh, regarding the SOC scheduled on call. Um, so we will be having four. The equivalent of 4.75 equivalent uh, paramedics on call, on schedule eight hours a day. We're still looking to see what the other 16 hours look like. 
So they'll, they'll share a three and three rotation, um, but still waiting for answers to see what the other 16 hours look like. Regional hospital board through the regional district uh, and then regular board later that day. The 20th on the Friday had a meeting and tour with the College of New Caledonia president, Dennis Johnson. He was supposed to be here last year when he was first uh, got the position. Uh, they share a, a funding agreement with the Vermont Learning Society and Dennis just really, or sorry, Mr. Johnson, just really wanted to get out of the office and get out to the Robson Valley and have a look around. Uh, the 23rd, of course, it's never a council report without a Southeast BC Connectivity Committee meeting. Uh, this time around, it was a, um, just more focus on what uh, what a three-year strategic outlook would look like for that committee. Uh, had a briefing yesterday, uh, as did we all, I'm hoping, on the vaccine, the rollout of the provincial vaccine certificate. It's a passport, uh, making it uh, clear that on the 13th, one entering certain events and certain indoor businesses that they will have to prove at least their first dose of the vaccine. Uh, joined Councillor Pearson last night for a meet and greet with the Access BC, uh, TOTA, UNBC. What are just a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this morning I took part in the K-12 post-secondary education COVID briefing, what that looks like uh, after September 7th. Uh, masks all around. Um, public school teachers do not need to prove their vaccination. Uh, students have to wear masks. Post-secondary uh, instructors must be vaccinated, show proof, uh, students wearing masks. So see how that rolls out. Um, and then joined the uh, accessibility assessment with Mr. Robinson amongst uh, TOTA and UNBC and Access BC uh, assessors on the Cranberry Marsh. Uh, and again, uh, hats off to uh, Councillor Pearson and his team at Tourism Valmont for supporting this initiative, um, allowing some, some staff allocation to that. And, and really, this isn't, this isn't gonna be a, a, a degrade on our report card. This is an opportunity to improve. And we might get a B plus, mm -hmm. but it'll still be an opportunity to improve. And I think uh, as we move forward, looking at not just accessibility, but inclusivity across the board, um, we can only strive to be better. So that's my report, motion to receive. Councillor G, Councillor Pearson, questions on the reports, Councillor Blanchett. So the Access BC people, are they letting the businesses know where they're falling short, if they are falling short? Yeah. Okay. So, so they're, they're not giving a report card per se to the businesses, but they will be going in and making little recommendations. A lot of, a lot of the changes are really low cost changes, like going from a round doorknob to a lever doorknob. It, it comes naturally to most of us, but if you've got any accessibility issues with your hands, a round doorknob is a struggle. So, um, so yeah, so they'll be talking with the business, explaining what they're doing, and uh, just leaving little recommendations and in their discussion. So, it's a great opportunity, and yeah. Oh, excuse me, and uh, and and great that Belmont's the first on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Further discussion on council reports. First couple. I'll send it to you. <laughs> We're going back to two meetings a month here shortly. Oh, okay. uh, all in favor of receipt? It's carried. Calendar events are there for information. Are there any public comments this evening? Okay, uh, to the floor, I'll say a quick preamble. Say One second yes. there, uh, Mr. Jamin, just before we start on public comments. Comments and questions regarding an item on the current agenda, and please, uh, from the podium as you are. 
Uh, comments and questions must be uh, put forth, must be on topics that are not normally dealt with uh, by village staff as a matter of routine. Uh, comments and questions shall be addressed through myself and answers given like likewise. Debates with or by individual members of council uh, or staff are not allowed during the public comment period. No comments will be made by council in replying to a question. Matters which may require, I haven't done this in a long time, Eugene, so very good. <laughs> About 18 months. May require action of council shall be tabled to a, a future meeting of this council. Uh, bylaws and TUPs that have been considered at a public hearing but have not yet received final approval should not be raised during public comment. Individuals must state their name and just their area of residence. We don't need your address uh, for identification purposes. And then comments and questions shall be limited to two minutes. Welcome, Mr. Jamin. Thank you. What I want to stress more than anything is that with the presentation we made on housing is that really this is something we need to work together on. It is not finger pointing, it is not adversarial. It's more, this is not an easy topic to deal with and let's get all hands on board to find solutions and um, hopefully have a much better situation here in Belmont. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leah Johnson. Um, I live in the village. <laughs> um, me and my husband moved here three years ago with our four children to take over and run the Petro Canada a and um, the, the pipeline being here has been very beneficial to us financially. However, it's put a massive strain on us as well. We've had to close our graveyard shift, um, which accounts to about $360,000 is what we're, we're losing over the span of a year. Um, we also are running with 20 staff, that's for both businesses, where we should be having about 42 staff to properly run. Um, we're looking at about a 65% increase this summer. We went from $8,000 summers per day in A&W to $15,000 days in A&W. We're doing about $55,000 to $60,000 in Petro Canada over what we normally do at forty and 45000 um, we um, have been trying to find staff um, all year. Um, we've even looked outside of Canada for um, staff coming from India. We have, we're, we've been working with someone from Vancouver. We have about seven to 10 staff members waiting to come work for us, but we don't have um, housing for them. Um, which is, again, it's posing stress for us all. Um, we have, through the business, tried to purchase several houses. Um, we've had um, offers, we've offered people X amount of dollars, um, but we have been outbid by ten to $20,000 by pipeliners, so therefore we have, still have no housing for staff. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, the village has had a, a, a housing problem since we moved here three years ago. We were lucky to find housing. I think the difference between then and now is that Rentals are being bought by pipeliners, which are pushing people out of the village. I know of six families that are leaving in the next two months because they're, um, the owners of their houses that they're renting from have, have or are putting their houses up for sale and they have no options. And as somebody from the inside looking out, when the pipeline's gone and we have no villagers, how are we running our businesses? Like that's, as it is, it's putting a massive stress on us. We have a couple team members right now that are working 157 hours in two weeks because we are short, such short staff. Me and my husband are working full time. My husband is working anywhere between 14 and 18 hours a day because we've got nobody and we have children. Um, I think at the end of the day, if this village is gonna survive, we need to think of housing because for people like us who love this village and want to stay here, at what point does the breaking point come when you can't run your business to its full potential? And it's not just affecting people coming in and traveling, it's affecting our community as a whole. And you can't run a village when there's no one working. And it's eventually gonna have people like us have to leave because we can't do it on our own. Thank you guys. Thank you. Further comments? 
Um, I'm Rashmi Narayan, and I live in the village as well. Um, Corey mentioned talking to Kenna at the regional district, and one of the things that uh, email she shared with us was uh, really the village staff need to share the imp housing impacts, uh, you know, uh, with with TMX and the other levels. So I know a lot of the com discussions have taken place at the housing committee level, uh, and the committee has no teeth. It's just a, a place we discuss ideas and issues, uh, but. It, it, I think it's up to staff and council to communicate how it's really impacting businesses and how locals, um, both to Trans Mountain, to the regional district, as well as the renamed National Energy Board. Um, partly, I think, is that when the permits were given and uh, there was a certain story that was communicated and what's happening now is very different. And I think that that's impacting the community a lot more and that needs to be shared and that's all i wanted wanted to say thank you thank you rashmi further comments this evening motion to receive councillor pearson councillor mclean all in favor of receipt it's carried and now I'll call for a motion, please, uh, to give a notice to proceed in camera under 15.1. There is a recommendation here that council proceed to an in-camera meeting, meeting closed, uh, for a consideration of one item per section 91K of the community charter to discuss matters related to K, negotiations and related discussions respecting the proposed provision of a municipal service that are at their preliminary stages and that, in the view of council, could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality if they're held in public. The reason for that is the status of a grant application. Motion, please. Councillor Blanchett, Councillor G, all in favour? It's carried. Thank you all.